It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app and, of course, streaming live on YouTube at the Team 980. Joining us now from Ashburn, it's J.P. Finley, NBC4 Sports, and, of course, host of B. Mitch and Finley over on 106.7 The Fan. Let's start off with, with this. I think a lot of people went into today most excited to hear from Cliff because with DQ's defensive experience, like people are kind of more interested in that other side of the ball, that OC hire, the number two pick, yada, yada. And then Joe Witt Jr. seemed to steal the show. What was it like in the room as those two men spoke today, the energy, any memorable quotes? Like as you walk out of the room and go back to the media annex afterwards, what's what's immediately sticking in your head is like the most important thing that happened today? I, I think you nailed it on kind of the, the tone of the day. Everybody was ready to be wowed by Kingsbury talking quarterbacks and offensive systems and what is this thing going to look like. And – I don't fault him for it at all. Um, you know, Cliff's been a head coach in the league for a number for four seasons. He's done these things so many times that I can't imagine he was too excited to talk to us today. Like it was more of like a a perfunctory measure than it was something that he was looking forward to. Um, whereas for Joe Witt, you know, he, he kind of came right out of the gate and was saying that he feels he had been ready for this for a long time. Um, and the thing that stood out to me with Joe Witt was obviously kind of his passion, his energy level. And that, I, I feel like, is similar to what stood out to me listening to Dan Quinn talk. And, and you could see how those two really seem to, like, mesh well and, and, and have a, a shared vision. But honestly, Craig, the, the thing that stood out to me most with Witt was a, kind of a – a story he told where he explained that he's just, he's dyslexic. And because of that, he realizes that like he learns differently and that in turn, he has to maybe coach different players differently. And he has to meet them where they are was what he said. And I just found that really refreshing from a previous regime that was pretty straightforward. Like this is how we do it, figure out how we do it. And, um, I don't know. I, I appreciated. I, I suppose that's not vulnerability. It's just telling, opening up, perhaps. And and I thought it was uh, a really telling moment of how somebody can connect with players and and find them in their own space to make them better and to make the unit more cohesive. No, I a hundred percent agree that that was the most important thing that was said today at that press conference because there's an understanding and it was kind of followed up with that quote. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, but basically like if a player's not learning, that's not the player's fault. That's on us as coaches. And the idea yeah. that you can't just be like, this is the information you're a pro. If you're not on board, we'll replace you because that's how you waste talent in this league. And the fact that he did mention he liked a guy like Forbes and obviously he liked Quan as well coming out of the draft. That gives me a lot of hope for those guys it, that we're, I'll, I'll tell you this, at the very least we're going to know whether or not they were, they were good football players at the NFL level. Cause these guys are going to give them a chance where last year, I think we're all just kind of like, I don't know. They look like busts, at least for part of the year in, in Quan's case, but well, these guys are not very good coaching. So maybe, maybe it's all on that side of it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and think about, what we all perceive to be really talented players on that defensive front that at times have shown that, and at other times it seemed fairly pedestrian. Like, how much of that has been previous team or a lack of talent development? And how much of it, it could still be the players. Maybe we'll find out. I think one important part of this exercise is also to remind ourselves, like, four years ago, plenty of people were excited about Jack Del Rio. And last year, plenty of people were excited about Eric Bieniemy. So, you know, today is an introduction to a coach and, and perhaps some principles and some insight, but I, I thought Joe Witt, the person, was really interesting. Um, he, he, he told the story about, you know, a lot of coaches like to stick around really late, but I, I don't do that. Like, to me, if you're sticking around late, it means you cheated yourself during the day. And I, I'd rather just go all out all day, and then when it's time to leave, it's time to leave. And... I, I can appreciate that because I do think on some level, like some politics get involved, like, oh, the head coach's light's still on, so I got to just stay here until he goes home. And, like, yes. 
I think we saw so much perception mattering in the last regime that didn't matter that, I, that I'd like to see less of it. And, and honestly, I mean, even Cliff, I would say, neither of these guys seem to care about perception today. No, I, I agree with that. And I will say, because I'm a gigantic nerd who's reading a book on sleep right now and the effect that it has on the brain. Like, this, the grind culture of the NFL that's like, be in at 4 a.m., stay till 11 p.m., and sleep on your couch is a terrible way to exist as a human, especially in a job that involves a lot of problem solving and creativity. Your brain literally becomes incapable of doing it if you deprive yourself of, sl- yourself of sleep that much. So, like, that was another very refreshing thing to be like, no, we're not going to play these games. Like, I'm going to go see my family, and then I'm going to go to sleep, and then I'll show up for work and work really hard the next day. Um, um, again, am I a gigantic nerd who's read a book on sleep? Sure. Is that also how every human being's brain works? Yes. So that seems like an important thing. Uh, JP Finley's with us here on the Hoffman Show. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting, both on Cliff's side and on Joe Witt Jr.'s side, let's talk about it from Witt's side first, and then we'll circle around and talk about the offense, is they both seem committed to almost nothing schematically. Um when when they you know wit as DQ did was like you know four three three four doesn't matter to me like is this team on the verge of switching fronts all of a sudden and what would that mean for what they have or do you think this is just a bunch of lip service because they don't really know what they're going to do yet and they're trying to keep the the options as open as possible? Um, I didn't hear that as switching the base defense. I for me and I've kind of been shouting this for a while like. Teams play so little base defense anyway that it's become more of like a, a talking point for fans and stuff than it is a reality. Sure. I think his point was more like, man, everybody plays cover two or cover three or quarters or whatever it is. Like, There's always going to be variations, but it's not like we're going to reinvent the wheel with some sort of defensive alignment that will change everything, which was kind of my understanding of it. Um, what I found really interesting – was, and he said this early, was that, you know, he just led a staff meeting letting everybody know we're going to do things differently, kind of we expect violence and we expect super physicality. And I, I, that almost sounds like he's letting players know to expect that. And, I, you know, that I find really interesting because I didn't think they were all that physical at the point of attack defensively. And I think, I mean – Curl was probably the best tackler, and then I think Kendall Fuller was decent in run support, but BSJ and certainly Forbes that won the real strength. Like, this dude knows his DBs, and it's going to be all over his DBs. And I think there's some level of, like, an immediate challenge to these guys. Like, um, this is going to have to look a lot different if you're going to be on the field for me. J.B. Finley, of course. B. Mitch and Finley on 106.7 The Fan is with us. Um, is there anything else from Witt's presser schematically, attitudinally, coaching-wise, or anybody else on staff on that side of the ball before we flip it over to Cliff in the offense that you think is worth noting as we finally got the full staff announcement earlier today and then heard from Joe Witt Jr. from the first time? Um, I mean, I, I'm excited to see Ken Norton. Um, I also think, just anecdotally, Joe Witt saying his favorite player ever is Sean Taylor. And then I was told later that he has a framed Sean Taylor jersey at his house. Like, I just think that's kind of a, a cool, random, serendipitous, full-circle moment. I think there's a lot of people about Joe Witt's age, that, especially if you played secondary, that, sh- that Sean's your favorite player. But I, I just thought that was kind of neat. Um, but beyond that, happy to go to Cliff. And, and maybe more so what we, like, didn't learn than did. Yeah, so Cliff... Seems like he's just kind of getting a bunch of smart dudes in the building and then they're going to figure it out, which I don't know how he sold that in the interview process. Hey, what's your plan? I don't know. We'll just hire some guys and then we'll then we'll come up with one. Okay, cool. But that's kind of the impression I got out of it, which is both exciting because they can play to their personnel, but also terrifying because I would like a little bit of structure, I would think, to be in place when I hire an offensive coordinator. What did, what did you make of the things that, again, to, I think you phrased that well, the things that we learned and the things that we didn't? I highly doubt he told us the same stuff he told Dan Quinn. That is probably think, also a good point. I think... 
because I can understand why he would be. But I thought he was fairly disinterested today, especially in divulging any sort of information. Or I don't think he wanted to talk Arizona. I don't think he wanted to talk Kyler. I don't think he wanted to talk how he landed here instead of the Raiders. Like any of it seemed to me that he wanted to avoid anything that would create a headline on ProFootballTalk.com. And I, I can kind of understand that for him. Um, but perhaps I'd say the thing that I have thought this throughout the process, and I continue to think it today after that presser, um, I, I think it's overly simplistic to say, well, Cliff coached Caleb at USC. Of course, they're going to make a big play to go get him. I, I don't – I think that what – like, that is just far too linear of an approach. And, and the fact that he mentioned a guy like Lamar today in, in what you want in a quarterback, to me, opens that up a lot broader. Um, and, and I just – I've kind of pushed back against that. Now, if, if Caleb gets the number two, I think it changes. But, like, I just – I don't think, oh, they hired Kingsbury. They're going to trade up to number one to get Caleb. And I, I feel better in that today. I, I've i been with you on that for a while now. Although it was uh, wacky. I don't know if you saw that Logan and I did our first uh, take command uh, mock draft the other day. And we used PFF's mock draft simulator. And, like, I wound up having to hit the start button, like, five times. And I think three of the five were Drake May is number one. And I was like, well, if that happens, that'd be cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, it seems unlikely. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll find out a lot more over the next couple of weeks when we head to Indy. But I, I definitely feel like if Chicago plays their cards right, either they or someone else is taking Caleb at one. What did you make of Cliff saying that uh, he would not call what the offense is going to be, whatever it is going to be, air raid anymore? I think that's actually accurate, and. If anybody's going to understand what that air raid truly was, or, or perhaps still is, would be Kingsbury, who played at it and then coached it. Um, I mean, that real air raid stuff that Mike Leach was running, when you had all those dudes at Texas Tech throwing for like 6,000 yards and then being fifth-round picks, I mean, go back and look at some of those names. We did this on the podcast the other day. Obviously, everybody remembers that catch Michael Crabtree made against Texas, right? Yep. In that were just inbound. Do you remember who the quarterback on that team was? Was that was that a that wasn't Cliff, was it? That was after Cliff, right? Correct. That was a dude you've never heard of that didn't make a lick of was, difference. Was, in it, the NFL. was that Graham Harrell? That was Harrell. Yes, sir. Right. Hell yeah! Don't tell me I don't know my old two thousand whatever year that was Texas Tech right. quarterbacks. But that that air raid system at that point in time was just beating defenses. And I, what, I don't, I legitimately never thought Cliff was trying to do that now. And I think, especially when you bring in Anthony Lynn, one, I, I think, legitimate criticism, um, I think I heard you and Logan talk about at one point, but we've heard in this cycle with Kingsbury is like, what does the run game look like? Does it match with the pass game? Does it create play action? And, and I don't know that you go back to Arizona, you can say a lot of that does. And I think bringing Lynn in will ideally help in that capacity. And I think the other part is the true air raid stuff. If you go back and watch Graham Harrell and all those types of dudes, none of them were mobile. It wasn't really until Mahomes did they have somebody that could run. And it was like a pocket three-step, five-step fire kind of, re you know what I mean? Like, the fact that Kingsbury's talking about mobility and guys that can make plays with their feet it is also a bit of a departure from the true air raid system. No, I that is definitely true. But there's also, I was talking about this earlier in the show, the, the spacing, like the space reading element of it where you're not necessarily as concerned with, like, what coverage are they in, but it's like, where is the space? That's actually very beneficial in the modern NFL because we have all these zone match, like amoeba-ish defenses that it's impossible unless you know the call to know what the original thing was. Like, we watch film all the time, and we're just like, what coverage is that? I don't know. There's just dudes everywhere. 
And if right. that's if that's the case, then some of that stuff making it into the new offense is very helpful. But I think, as you said, marrying it with Anthony Lynn, Bobby Johnson, et cetera, um, and what they bring is uh, is very helpful. Uh, your co-host on Beltway Football Pod, Mitch Tischler, asked about Bobby Johnson, uh, who was, I think, everyone's biggest concern considering the last couple of years in New York. What did you make of Cliff's answer about the commander's new O-line coach? I kind of what I expected there, and I think – I, I don't know enough. Um, I, I, I just don't know enough about that situation. I kind of need to dig into it for my own understanding. But the, the Giants had a ton of injuries along the offensive line. I don't know that they developed and, and had good backups and all that, but I do think some of this year's trouble was, I mean, just how beat up they were. I mean, if you look at the combinations and the amount of players, or think about just Justin Pugh, who I know we both talked to at the Super Bowl. And the fact that he was signed to the practice squad on a Thursday, and what would that be, nine days later, was playing left tackle in a nationally televised late game? Like, they clearly had some trouble up there. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, it's not – of all the hires, it's the one that probably makes the least amount of sense. But they, they also obviously have their process that they stuck with that they feel quite good about yeah, no, I think that's fair. And and you talked about the mobility stuff that Cliff mentioned, and obviously uh, Johnson, the experience the last couple of years with Daniel Jones and getting him going. So that that seems like the connective he, tissue to me. Did he mention Josh Allen prior to that, or did I? Yeah, he that did. Somewhere? He did. Yeah, okay. So um, that that connective tissue of the mobile quarterback, I think, is is definitely a huge reason why Bobby Johnson gets the nod. We'll see how it all comes together. Uh, JP Finley talking about it on your televisions on NBC Four, uh, in your ears on 106.7 The Fan and the Beltway Football Pod. Uh, JP, uh, safe travels back to uh, your side of the river, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, thanks for your time, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Take care. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.